All right, let's open with a word of prayer. Abba, you are Yahweh. There is none beside you. You are the king of Israel. You are the creator of the universe. You are our God. And you created us in your image and your likeness. We are here to give you the glory that is yours. Father, open our eyes as we study your word. Reveal who you are to us. We want to know you. We want to know Yeshua and the power of his resurrection. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. The Shem Yeshua Mishiachenu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen and amen. All right. We've got a double portion. It's Tazria and Metzora, which means there is not going to be a leap month this year. So we uh, sometimes add a 13th month to the year to make everything reconcile with the, the harvest cycle, which is what Yahweh's calendar is built on. But this year, we're only going to have 12. So conceived is what Tazria means, and leper is what Metzora is, and it comes from Vayikra, or Leviticus 12, 1 through 15, 33. And we're going to start reading at the very beginning in Leviticus 12. It says, Then Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she will be unclean seven days, as in the days of her customary impurity she shall be unclean. And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. She shall then continue in the blood of her purification 33 days. She shall not touch any hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her pur purification are fulfilled. But if she bears a female child, then she shall be unclean two weeks, as in her customary impurity, and she shall continue in the blood of her pur purification 66 days. When the days of her purification are fulfilled, whether for a son or a daughter, she shall bring to the priest a lamb of the first year as a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove as a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then he shall offer it before Yahweh and make atonement for her. That means covering. Doesn't mean that she sins. She just needs to be ritually purified again to be able to go to the temple and physically worship in, in physical purity. And she shall be clean from the flow of her blood. This is the law for her who has born a male or a female. And if she is not able to bring a lamb, then she may bring two turtle doves or two pigeons, one as a burnt offering and the other as a sin offering. So the priest shall make atonement for her and she shall be clean. So Yahweh always makes allowances for us no matter where we are in our walk of life. He doesn't make things too hard for us. It's always going to be a sacrifice to come up with what he desires. But... He always makes it where we can. So if we weren't wealthy, we didn't have to bring the whole lamb. We could bring the two that were much cheaper. Now look, look at Luke 2.21. Growing up, my dad's a Rama graduate, and every denomination has some truth, but then you're usually, usually a bunch of junk mixed in that, that taints it. And so one of the things that was junky about how I was raised was they pro taught the prosperity message. Now, they would use Abraham. He's wealthy in cattle and gold and silver and servants and all this other stuff. And, and it's true. Abraham was wealthy. And the thing is, it's not wrong to be wealthy if you can respond like Abraham would. He'd, he'd give whatever he needed at a heartbeat. The wealth didn't have him. But they taught that we're all supposed to be wealthy so that we can be blessed, and that's a sign of our blessing and a sign of our faith, and it's just a bunch of out-of-balance junk that's not true. He does want us blessed because it takes money to get the gospel to every nation. It's all about getting the gospel to every nation on earth. So it takes money to do that. So there's nothing wrong with having money, but it's not to buy a second car if you don't need it or a house on the beach or whatever. If somebody wants to give you that, there's nothing wrong with having that. If Yahweh wants to bless you with it, but don't pursue it yourself. So prosperity, money is a tool just like anything else. It can be used for good or for evil. The rich young ruler that came to Yeshua, Yeshua said, you lack something. You need to sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. And he had great wealth, and he wasn't willing to do it. And that's why it's hard for a rich man to enter in. But yet Yeshua wasn't asking him to be poor. Because later on, the disciples said, hey, we've left everything and followed you. What do we get, basically? And he says, well, anybody that's left houses or fathers or lands or mothers or fathers or wife or children or anything else, for my sake and the kingdom's sake, will receive in this lifetime 100-fold with persecutions. 
He wasn't wanting him to be poor. He was wanting him to get rid of his false god so that Yahweh could bless him with the true riches. And he was going to be richer than what he started with if he'd have obeyed, but he didn't. Just like Job. Job lost it all, but he was more wealthy when he finished than what he was when he started because he stayed faithful. And it could have been that same way for the rich young ruler. But money is a hard thing for most people to handle. So even Yeshua's parents, look at this in Luke 2.21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Yeshua. And this is Yochin Vav Ain. It's his name in the ancient manuscripts of Matthew, the Dutilit and the Munster, also in the Aramaic Peshitta. You get a modern Hebrew Bible. You look up the name in, in one of the Gospels of the Messiah. It's Yod Shin Vav Ain. The Jews understand Hebrew, the biblical Hebrew. It's their culture. It's their language. And so we need to use what the biblical rules of Hebrew are as far as the names go. Sacred names are good. And we don't always agree on everything. Yeshua is kind of a no-brainer because it's in the manuscripts. We've got multiple witnesses of it. Now, Yod Hey Vav Hey, Yahweh, Probably 70% of the scholars believe that it's Yahweh. Some people believe it's Yahweh, the guy that got us into the movement, pronounced it Yahweh. Some pronounce it Yehovah. And, I mean, that's how it's kind of vowelized in the Torah scrolls. Jehovah is where the Jehovah Witnesses, but there's no J sound in Hebrew. So even, even in Europe today, we went over to Holland when my, our daughter Promise was a kid, and we stayed with a couple whose name was J-A-N and J-O. J-A-N was the guy's name. It was Jan. And J-O was the woman's name, and her name was Yo. It's Yan and Yo. It was not, you, they don't even pronounce a J sound there. And it's kind of just unique, I guess, to, to America, but it's Yeshua. And uh, Yahweh, or Yehovah, or however you want, it's, it's going to have the Y sound, not the J sound. So there's rules of biblical Hebrew. And one of our responsibilities as believers is to provoke Israel to jealousy. Paul explains this in Romans chapter 11. He became a... a, a um, apostle to the Gentiles that he might provoke his brothers to emulation it says to jealousy and then he says that the wild branches being grafted in they are supposed to provoke the natural branches to jealousy the ones that were broken off and so our job is to be more obedient than them to be like Yeshua Yeshua used proper Hebrew he didn't make up names for God that they're all goofy and stuff that was going to drive the Jews away he wasn't trying to tell them you're wrong and everything I mean there's there's variations in the language even in the time of the kings, I mean, we see when Ephraim got crosswise with the rest of Judah, they would, they would flush out Ephraim by trying to get them to say Sibboweth or Shibboweth, and they couldn't all say it the same. So there's always been differences in pronunciation. It's not a magic formula. You don't have to get everything right. We're not practicing witchcraft. That's what witches do. You've got to have the incantation just right for it to work, and that's not how Yahweh works. So we need to understand that we need to have some patience with one another in the sacred name and I believe we should use his names as they appear in the original languages they were sh shielded by the Jews because yod heh vav -Hey is too holy for them to pronounce I believe they completely misunderstand it we're not to make his name they basically say common and and they, so they won't say it at all we're not supposed to profane the name of Yahweh I mean there's it's the death penalty too so there was one guy that would that that blaspheme Yahweh and they took him out and stoned him when Yahweh told him to so I mean his name is sacred and it's holy and we we need to treat it with reverence but we don't need to be making up goofy names because we claim the Jews lied and all this other stuff the different characters in Hebrew they never changed the rules yeah we had different characters when God wrote the ten words with his finger it was probably in paleo and we now use the modern block script for Aramaic that we picked up in Babylon but you know what when Yahweh wrote his name in the mountains above Jerusalem he wrote it in the Aramaic block script, yod heh vav -Hey, in the mountains right above Jerusalem. And he knew when we would have the technology to have satellites to be able to see something like that, or airplanes or whatever. And so he used the language that we would be familiar with. Yahweh doesn't still use paleo. If we used it today in our language, maybe he would. But he's going with what we're using today. He's not afraid of change. It's not more spiritual to go back and use the original characters. I mean, we've got it on our flag here. You can see the... the paleo and then there's even an older form called pictograph but the thing is the characters just because they look different the rules don't change they all pronounce the same way all the rules of Hebrew are still the same it's never changed I mean obviously through the years the the languages have progressed a little bit just like in any other language but there's not a big difference and there's not any rules Yahuwah is the name of a sacred name demon Lou White came up with this and his logic was well if you take Yehuda 
and you take out the Dalit, it spells yod heh vav and that's pronounced Yahuwah. Well, that's not how Hebrew works. That is, that's a man that's seeking glory himself. And actually, if you go back and you study what Lou White did with the electric Ladyland head shop he used to own, he's had idols, demon masks, all kinds of stuff in there that are just wicked. The guy is a plant. And people, we need to understand this. Follow the sacred name you're convicted to as long as it follows the rules of Hebrew because the whole point is we need to use his name so that the Jews will be provoked, but then the rest of our lifestyle needs to match up with that of Yeshua so that they understand that we are living holy. We are living obedient. We are being better Jews than they are, and that's what's going to provoke them, not making up goofy stuff that's going to push them away. That's the enemy's design to try to push them further from the truth, and we need to work with Yahweh and not the enemy. So anyway, that was kind of a rabbit trail at no extra charge. <laughs> but the whole point was Yahweh works with us where we are, and he's looking at our heart. So let's go back up to the passage in Luke again. I started trying to go down too far. So his name was Yeshua, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law, the Torah of Moshe were completed. See, Yeshua's parents obeyed the laws of Moshe. And it's not because it was the old covenant. If you look at the last verse of Hebrews 8, the old covenant's called old because the new covenant's called new. It's still with us. And if you read there, it's ready to vanish away. It's waxing old, it says. But it's still with us. And Yeshua said, till heaven and earth passes, not one jot or one tittle will pass. So we know there's going to be a timing to some of the commandments. When there's no more death, you're not going to need to sacrifice to be purified from the dead. So some of it's going to be altered a little bit. The spiritual principles are eternal, though. They're forever settled in heaven. So the purification according to the law of Moses, they obeyed it. When Yeshua would heal the leper, he said, go show yourself to the priest. According to the law of Moses, the creator of the universe is telling the people he healed to follow the law of Moses. It didn't change when he hung on the tree. He still wants us to follow the law because he's the one that gave it to Moses. It is the word of our father through Yeshua that spoke it to Moses and had Moses write it down. Moses is a scribe. He didn't come up with any of it. He was just used to write it down. It says, now when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to Yahweh, as it is written in the Torah of Yahweh. This is what we're supposed to do. This is expressing love to the Father. This is being obedient children. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the Torah of Moshe, or Torah of Yahweh, what we just read, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. They didn't bring the lamb. Joseph and Mary weren't rich businessmen like it's been taught in the, in the prosperity movement. They did not have the extra money to bring a lamb. For the Son of God, the creator of the universe. He didn't think it important to put him in a rich family to have all of his needs met. He did it as an example to us. The majority of the people aren't wealthy. But he can use anybody, just like he used his son and placed him in the family uh, that wasn't in the upper class. But they were faithful and they loved Yahweh. That was the important thing, and he knew that. So by stating that Joseph and Mary offered a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, the text shows us that they were obviously not wealthy, not like what has been taught. So obviously material prosperity is not a clear sign of being blessed by Yahweh, though when money was needed, Yahweh provided. The wise men provided gold and frankincense and myrrh to finance a trip to Egypt, and Yeshua had wealthy people who supported him. Talks about it in Mark 15:41. So much so that he had a treasurer. He had a full-time guy taking care of the money that was flowing through his ministry. Yahweh will bless us with money if we are wise with it and we do with it what we need to. I mean, at the last, in, in John, we saw that when Judas got up, the, the other apostles thought that, hey, maybe they're, uh, they're going to give to the poor because that was something they did all the time. And that's very important. So it was, it was not to hoard it up and to, to buy the best horses and chariots to ride around in or anything like that, because Yeshua could have had the best. He's, he's God in the flesh. He could have rode around on the fanciest horse or had the neatest chariot or, or whatever, but that's not how he rolled. He chose to identify with the people where the people were. He was humble, but yet all of his needs were provided for. He lacked nothing. 
had no place to lay his head, it said at one point, but he always had somewhere to go. The Father always provided. Look at Matthew 6, 28. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Now, as we study this out, we're going to see why we can expect him to clothe us. We're his beloved. We're the apple of his eye. He lives to bless his people. If his people align with his instructions so that he can see, we have to get in alignment with him so that he can pour his blessing out. He won't bless you in your agenda. He will bless you as you pick up his agenda and you walk with him. Verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek the people without a covenant. You don't want to be identified as a Gentile if you're a believer. Gentiles have no covenant. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So Yeshua tells us to focus on things of the kingdom of God, not of physical needs or prosperity, although it's not wrong to be prosperous, but we use the tool for what he wants us to use it for. So what is the kingdom of God? He says to seek first the kingdom of God. And I want us to look today at who is God? I mean, Elohim is the Hebrew word. It's a masculine plural. But who is God really? We call the father Yahweh. Who is Yahweh? The father was encouraging me about 430 this morning by showing me that when Jacob saw the staircase or ladder, as it's written in the King James and New King James to heaven, and that comes from Genesis 28, 12, which we're going to look at, that he was seeing what he was seeing was the function of Yeshua. Let's turn over there to Genesis 28, 12. Now, the father was downloading this to me today, and I didn't have enough time to print the scriptures out. Normally we do, and they're normally on the screen. But today, you get to look them up yourself like I do. So Genesis 28, 12. And let's get back up to verse 10. It starts the paragraph, and it kind of gets some context. Genesis 28, 10. It says, in Jacob, or Yaakov, went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder or a staircase set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. This was the, the path to heaven. This was the way to heaven. The angels were coming up and down on it. They weren't flying in spaceships. They were walking on the staircase. Now, we know the Caribbean, there's wheels within wheels that they can travel in that mode. But the majority of the time, the angels, the Caribbean are the ones that go with the Father, pretty much. They're, they're hanging around the throne room and stuff. And um, anyway, the normal angels, it talks about in Hebrews, be careful when we entertain strangers. For a lot of times, we entertain angels unaware. So... Not all angels look like the Caribbean. They're not freaky looking. They look like men most of the time. I mean, some of them can have wings. The Caribbean and the Seraphim, we know the Seraphim had six wings. The Caribbean had four wings. There's none of them mentioned that only has two, though, like you see in pictures. I've never seen that one. But anyway, they can traverse up and down on this particular staircase. So what is the staircase? What are we looking at? It's, it's the way that the angels come up and down. And the answers, obviously, will come that way, too. But the function of Yeshua, he's not just the staircase. He's also the door of the sheepfold. Look at John 10, 1 through 9. John 10, verse 1 through 9. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, 
He that enters not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This is why we need to stay sheep and not goats. Goats have their own agenda. They'll follow whatever. And if you become a goat, you can no longer just hear the master's voice. You hear all the voices. So stay submitted. Stay a sheep. This parable spoke Yeshua unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spoke unto them. Then said Yeshua unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. They were used by the enemy to bring in confusion, to tell lies. But the sheep did not hear them, but the goats did. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. So Yeshua is this traversement. We abide in him. We can come in and out. But when we're part of him, we're part of what he is, too. Let's look at John 14. 1 through 6, because he's not only the door, he's the way, the truth, and the life. John 14. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, it says, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas says unto him, Lord, we know not where you're going. How can we know the way? Yeshua said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So Yeshua is saying that I am the way. He is explaining that I am the staircase. Not right here specifically, but that's one of the things it's referring to. So what is the way? Let's look at 1 Timothy 2.5. 1 Timothy 2.5. First Timothy 2 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Messiah Yeshua. So even though we know that, that Yeshua from our other studies is part of Elohim, he is the physical body of God, the creator, he's the mediator between God and man because he came to this earth to be the last Adam. And so he had to be fully a man to be able to do what Adam messed up originally. And so he had to be born of a virgin so that he would have no sin nature, just like the first Adam. First Adam had no sin nature, no, no flesh to pull at him. He got deceived, or actually he, he committed treason. His wife got deceived, but he committed high treason and chose to follow the path that his wife was fooled into rather than running the snake off and interceding for his wife to see her forgiven because she was only deceived. Yahweh would have forgave her. But because Adam decided to commit treason, he brought sin on the whole humankind. Because just like in Hebrews 7, it talks about how Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek because he was in the loins of Abraham. It would be a couple generations before Levi was born. He was going to be Abraham's uh, grandson, I guess, or great-grandson. Anyway, he was still in the loins of Abraham. So Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek. And the lesser pays ties to the greater. So the Melchizedek priesthood is the greater priesthood, it points out. But the fact I want us to notice is that Levi was in the loins of Abraham. 
Well, when God created Eve, he didn't make a new body out of the dust of the ground and breathe some new breath into that. He took what was already in Adam, a rib to form her body, and then some of the life that was already there, her presence that was already there, and made another individual so that Adam and Eve could come together as one flesh. And Yeshua points out that what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. God supernaturally joins a qualified marriage, a husband and wife. It's like the born again experience. You literally, he fuses us together as one, echad, with one another. We can come together as one flesh, but he makes us one spirit. And it's a reflection of our relationship to him as well. But it's interesting because when Adam sinned, God never made other bodies and he never breathed new life. We were all in that first breath that was in Adam. When Yahweh breathed that breath into Adam, he breathed everybody there. That's why when Adam sinned, it affected the whole human race. Just like when Levi was in the loins of Abraham, we were all in the loins of Adam. And that's why sin came on the whole world. And it's just the way he set things up. There's some people that teach that, oh, we're all in the throne room and he sends us down when a new baby. No, it doesn't work that way. He did it all in the beginning. It was all done in that breath that he breathed into Adam. He'd already planned it all out. He had it all mapped out, every, everything figured out. And then when he executed it, he only had to do it once. And it was an ongoing process that would produce the whole human race. But it made it when Adam sinned, it affected us all. So we all got the result of his sin transferred onto us. So we all have a sin nature. Our bodies want to do what our bodies want to do, which is not what Yahweh wants us to do. It's living for pleasure, living for sin, living for the things of the flesh. The flesh nature, basically inspired by the enemy, to not want to be one with God. And so Yeshua had to come fully as a man, and again, had to be born of a virgin, so that sin nature that passed on from the seed of man, see, he wasn't in Adam's loins when Adam sinned. He was with the father, so the father had to kind of come in and insert him into this thing, and that's why he had to be born of a virgin. He couldn't be made with man's seed. He had to be have the seed of his father that was sinless, so he would not have the sin nature in his flesh, so he could be just like the first Adam and not have that pull. And so he lived perfectly, just like the first Adam did not. We don't know how long it took for Adam to sin, but eventually he did. But Yeshua lived his whole life sin-free. And so he was able to be that sinless sacrifice, fully a man. And that's what this is pointing out, the man Messiah Yeshua. He is the mediator between us, the human race now, and God. Because he came here and he lived his life here. It talk, talks about in Philippians that when he, he was came down he emptied himself he didn't come down knowing who he was it says in the gospels he had to grow in wisdom and in stature just like we do he had to be taught he had to learn and he did that and mary and joseph taught him who he was told him about the the magi and and the shepherds and and how he was born and everything and so he he grew up knowing who he was but he had to walk in it by faith just like we do he had to believe the word he didn't lo live this life as god he had to learn that he was, that he'd come from the Father and started flowing in the Spirit. He never did a miracle, though, until he was baptized in the River Jordan and got filled with the Spirit, just like we have to do. He got the power of the Father when he was filled with the Holy Spirit at the River Jordan. So he grew and lived as a normal man for 30 years of his life, growing and experiencing things like we have to. He was touched with all the feelings of our, our infirmities. He was fully a man. And because of that fact, he also had the authority of a man because in Genesis 126, we were commanded as men to subdue the earth, to take dominion, and that was given to man. And so Yeshua was operating in that authority as a man, and that's how he was able to operate the way that he did. And it wasn't because he was God. It was because he was a man anointed by the Holy Spirit. Exactly what we can be now, what we are when we're born again. And so he did it as an example to live the perfect life to show us what we are supposed to do to give glory to the Father. He followed the whole Torah, not so that we don't have to, but as an example of how to love the Father, how to love our neighbor. It's all about love. It all hangs on the two greatest commandments, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. The rest are the details on how we're supposed to do this by Yeshua's example. He showed us how we're supposed to do it. So he is the way to the Father. He's the only way to the Father. He is the truth. And we know from Psalms 119, let's flip over there and look at it, that Yahweh's Torah 
is the truth. Truth does not change. It isn't truth today and not truth the next day. I mean, the whole Psalms 119, there's a whole ministry named after this psalm because it's all about the life in the Torah, basically. I mean, he says, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, Yahweh, your word is settled in heaven. What word? The Torah. That's what this whole psalm is talking about. Forever, his Torah, all the word is settled in heaven. Verse 142 says, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. Truth doesn't change. It doesn't become non-truth. Your Torah is the truth. If, if, if it's Yahweh has given us truth, why aren't we embracing it? Why aren't we understanding what it really is? Because the devil doesn't want you to. He wants you to misunderstand and twist the writings of Paul. Paul walked in the Torah. Paul took unnecessary vows, Acts 18, 18. He shaved his head in Sancria and had a vow that was the vow of the Nazarite from number six, included three animal sacrifices, and it's not required. It's a voluntary vow that Paul voluntarily did to show Yahweh that he loved him. It wasn't trying to earn anything. It was because he loved Yahweh, and he knew what the Torah was about. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your Torah is the truth. And Paul knew it and walked by it. You've just misunderstood what he wrote because he was the apostle of the Gentiles, and we don't come in the same way that the Jews do. We don't know the Torah when we come to know Yeshua usually. The Jews grow up with it, so they're expected to walk in it, all of it, because they learn it as, as children. It takes us some time to learn it, so we, we come into it a little bit differently. But he goes in in verse 151, he says, You are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are truth. There's not one that's done away with, like Yeshua said, till heaven and earth passes away. Not one jot or one tittle will pass from the Torah till it's all fulfilled. And then he says, and if you just break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so, you'll be counted least in the kingdom of heaven. You just get one of them wrong. You lose your reward. You throw it all out, you're told to depart because you have no way to love the Father if you get rid of his Torah. But what I want us to look at verse 160. He says, Your word is true from the beginning, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. Your word is true from the beginning. All of your word. Every bit from Genesis to Revelation, it is all his truth. And this is what Yeshua is referring to, basically. In John 17, 17. I'm going to flip over there real quick. He's quoting basically the Torah. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. Or you could say, Your Torah is truth. Just like Moses or David said. His word is the truth, and it's forever settled in heaven. All of it. Not just from Matthew to Revelation, from Genesis to Revelation. It is all the truth. And Yeshua had the whole arsenal. He could have used any of it. He knew what he was going to teach Peter and James and everybody else. He could have quoted anything he needed to to defeat the devil. He pulled out the biggest sword, and he quoted three quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, demonstrating the power of the Torah to defeat the leader of the kingdom of darkness. That's why the devil doesn't want you walking in the Torah, Christian, because he wants you to not have that big gun that Yeshua used. He wants you to think it's no longer relevant. But it was enough to defeat the top guy. So he's the way, he's the truth and the life. John 1, 14, or 1, 4 talks about him. In him was life. In him was life and the life was the light of men. Yeshua was the vessel for the life. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He was Elohim. He is Elohim. One with the Father. In John 10, it talks about, I and the Father are one. Echad is the word that would have been used in the Hebrew. It's the same Greek word that's used to translate the Shema, and I believe it's Mark, when it says, Hero Israel. Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh Echad. It's the same Greek word that's used there. So he is the life. Look at John 10, 28. John 10, 28 says, And I give unto them eternal life, 
and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Yeshua is the one that gives us eternal life. He said so in John 10. Just like the Father. He goes on and says, and the Father gives eternal life. And, and the Father holds you in his hand. No man plucks you out. He and the Father are one is what he says. John 14, 6. Yeshua says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He is the life. The Father is life, but we can't go directly to the Father. That's what he's pointing out. Psalms 110, verse 1 through 4, points out who Yeshua really is. I mean, we know he's the Son of God. Psalms 110, verses 1 through 4, says, Yahweh said unto Adonai, is what it says in the Hebrew, or the Lord said unto my Lord, is how it reads in the English and the King James, but it's Yahweh said unto Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. How is the Father making the enemies of Yeshua his footstool? He's seated on the throne. Yeshua's seated next to him. It's through us. We're going to look at it and see. But we're the ones that the Father is using to make Yeshua's enemies his footstool. We now carry the fullness of the Godhead bodily in us, just like Yeshua did. Yahweh shall send the rod of his strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of your enemies. So Yeshua's coming back to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And he's got enemies here. He doesn't destroy them all when he comes. He wants to give everybody a chance to repent. Now, the ones that took the mark of the beast, they're going to not have a chance, but their kids will. Verse 3, the people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. It says, Yahweh is sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is his role. He is the mediator, but he's the mediator because he's the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, the true priesthood. The one that Levi paid tithes to. So Yeshua is the only way to the Father because of who he is as the high priest. The priesthood was set up in the temple and the tabernacle to show us that you can't go into the Holy of Holies yourself. You can't go directly to the Father. You have to have a mediator. It was set up as an illustration to present the truth of how the kingdom works. And so... We have to go through Yeshua as our high priest. There's no other way to the Father. The Jews will not be able to make it going directly to Yahweh, even praying at the wailing wall, saying, Mashiach, come. He's already come. He is coming again. But if they don't embrace him before he returns, they're going to die and go to hell because they're going to have to pay their own price for their own sin because the only way Yeshua's blood will atone for our sin is if you make him Lord, Master. That is the only way it works. So no man comes to the Father except through him. Yeshua is the only way to the Father, like I said, because he is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He is our mediator between God and man, like we saw in 1 Timothy 2.5. Above and beyond that, Yeshua is that staircase that Jacob saw, literally the superhighway between heaven and earth, the bridge between the physical and the spiritual. In John chapter 4, he tells the woman at the well in Samaria that true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And Shavuot was a picture of that. The first Shavuot, 50 days after we crossed the Red Sea, we came to Mount Sinai, and he spoke with his very own voice, and he gave us the ten words and then the rest of his Torah. So the first Shavuot represented the instructions on how to worship him in truth. And then we know in Acts 2 when Shavuot, or Pentecost, had fully come, he poured out his Holy Spirit to fulfill Ezekiel's prophecy. He was going to put his spirit within us and cause us to walk in his statutes and keep his judgments to do them. The purpose of the Holy Spirit wasn't to just be able to speak in other tongues so that people could hear them praise God in their own language. It was literally to help them be like Yeshua, to be obedient like Yeshua so that the blessing would come on us so we could bless others as well. So spirit and truth. Yeshua is the bridge between the spirit realm where the Father lives and the natural realm, the physical realm. The truth of Torah is a physical truth. There's a spiritual truth to it as well. And, it, and it, anytime we see something in the scripture, 
the way with the mark of the beast, the abomination of desolation. There's always a physical application, and there's going to be a spiritual application. It's both, spirit and truth, and that's something we have to keep in mind. Yeshua is that bridge between the two realms. Look at John 1, 50 and 51. He actually tells this to Philip. John 1, 50 says, Yeshua answered and said unto him, Because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree, believe you, you shall see greater things than these. And he's talking to Philip. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter you shall see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He is that way. Yeshua is that staircase that Jacob saw. The angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now, what really blew me away about this revelation is when the Father, what he said about this was about his children. He told me that when we're born again of his spirit, the new creation, and let's look at that real quick in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Messiah, he is a new creature, it says in the King James, or a new creation, other translations say. New creation, something that never existed before. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God now, who has reconciled us to himself by Yeshua Messiah and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. See, we've taken over Yeshua's job now. The Father did that to us. We are now his vessel that his full presence abides in now, just like it did in Yeshua. We don't get the Holy Spirit in part. We get the whole thing. When Yeshua moves in, he brings everything with him, everything he's part of. Verse 19 again, to wit God, that God was in Messiah, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So what Yeshua shared, we're supposed to share it now. What Yeshua did, we're supposed to do it now. We've taken over his ministry. We are now, I mean, he is the head, we are the body. We are one with Yeshua. We know that. We're the body of Messiah. We all know that. Verse 20 says, now then, we are ambassadors for Messiah. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Messiah's stead, be you reconciled to God. We are working for Messiah now, just like he was here. He is here. He's in us. We're just his hands and his feet now. So we go as he directs. And even if he doesn't direct, he says, go preach the gospel to every creature. So we just go. And then he'll direct us as he wants if he wants us to go somewhere specific. But he gave us general marching orders. We're to go make disciples of the nations. He doesn't say which one. He does tell us to start in, in the book of Acts, start in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the other most parts of the earth. But he's got people already doing that. So we just start preaching wherever we're at. I mean, you go to Walmart, you can share the love of Yahweh. You go at the gas station, anywhere you're at. When you see somebody that's having a need that needs some healing, you can tell them, hey, the Father uses me to heal people. Can I pray for you? And Yeshua wants us ministering his love just like he did. Everywhere he went, he was there to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up the broken, to set at liberty the captives. And this is our job now. And we have the same spirit that Yeshua had dwelling in us. We have no less power than he did. What we have is a flesh nature that we have to crucify. Yeshua didn't have that because he had to be the last Adam, so he wasn't hobbled with the flesh. We are. But he gives us his spirit so that we can overcome the flesh. We can crucify the flesh daily. But we have to do it, and it takes discipline. We have to purpose to do it. It doesn't happen automatically. He says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice. He's not going to do that for us. We have to do that. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. And we're not conformed to this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. We have to get into the book. We have to read it. He's not going to do it for us. We have to make the decision, and then we have to have the discipline to do it. He will help us. It's God that's in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He'll give us the desire and the ability to, but we still have to do it. We still have to walk it out. We still have to choose to. 
For he made, he has made him to be sin for us, or a sin sacrifice for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made. Now this term might be made is the way it should be, because it's not an automatic thing, and it's not a guaranteed thing, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So when we're born again and he cleanses us from all the sins past, like we studied in the Beth, we are now the righteousness of God in Messiah. He has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. So the only thing left is righteousness. But sometimes we stumble and fall. He says a righteous man falls seven times, but he gets back up. So when we stumble and we fall, in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So again, we stand before him righteous again. No more unrighteousness. And we can walk that way. As soon as we blow it, which unfortunately the flesh kind of tugs us that way, sometimes we stumble and fall. We confess our sin, we get back up, and we keep on going, and we walk righteous. We don't have to stay unrighteous very long. Just as soon as you realize you blew it, get right back up. Say, whoa, well, Lord, I blew it. Forgive me. And get right into that place. That's the secret place of the Most High. The devil can't touch you when you're walking that way. It's when we sin and we blow it that he gets us out of that secret place and he can mess with us. So jump right back in and get in that place again. Don't let the devil tempt you to do that. So we are new creations in him, and it is so much deeper than what we've really ever realized. I've never understood it this way, the way he explained it to me today. Paul reveals that to be joined with the Lord is to be one spirit with him. Let's look at that in 1 Corinthians 6, 17. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. says but he that is joined unto the lord is one spirit we are echad when we are born again just like he fuses together with our wife or actually he didn't do that before we were born again he does it after we are but when we're born again he fuses us together with himself we become one spirit with the creator that's pretty awesome It's even more awesome than we understand. He is the I am of Exodus 3, 4, 14. Let's look at that. He reveals himself to Moses. Moses says, well, who am I going to say sent me when he's telling Moses to go back and set his people free? Exodus 3, 14. Let's go back up to verse 12. It says, And he said, Certainly, I will be with you. And this shall be a token unto you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and I shall say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they will say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And instead of God just telling him, I'm Yahweh, he described himself. And God said unto Moses, Elohim said unto Moshe, I am that I am. And he said, you shall say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent you. What in the world is I am? He's everything. Everything. I mean, earth worshipers kind of have... A little bit of truth. They unfortunately worship the creation rather than the creator, but the creation reflects his glory. I mean, you see the creation, you see the glory of Yahweh. He is in everything, and he's everywhere. Look at Psalms 139, starting at verse 8. Psalms 139, starting at verse 8. It says, this is David speaking, if I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall your hand lead me and your right hand shall hold me. You can't get away from him. He's everywhere. He is everything. 
the Jews were the original people of Yahweh, and until they rejected Yeshua, they were the cutting edge of wisdom and revelation on this earth as far as a nation. And there's some of them that understood that everything is contained in Yahweh, that he kind of opened up a hollow spot, kind of like a womb to make this creation that we're all contained in him. I mean, based on the Psalms of David and everything else, they understand we're all in Yahweh. He is everything. You can't get away from Yahweh. You can't see anything that he didn't create. Everything is because of him. Even the devil, he created the devil. Behold, I've created the waste or destroy, but no weapon formed against you will prosper. And all that rise up against you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of Yahweh. And what great will be the peace. And we thank you for it, Father. You are so good. He is everything. You can't get away from him. Now, he has made us to be part of himself. Just as it said, if we're joined to him, we're one spirit. Yeshua was his body. In him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Yeshua was the perfect representative. But now we're Yeshua's body, and we're one spirit with the Father. We have taken over Yeshua's job. <laughs> He's made us part of himself, part of the I am through Yeshua. And John 14 kind of illustrates this. I want us to look at that. We're going to read the whole chapter. John 14. In John 14, Yeshua says, Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, because he's part of Elohim. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, he never leaves us now in spirit. He goes with us everywhere. He's always with us. We don't physically see him right now, but we are joined with him. We're seated with him in heavenly places. It talks about we're going to look at that. That's Ephesians 2. I don't know. Actually, I might not have written that down. But it says in Ephesians 2 that we're seated with him in heavenly places. Yeshua and the Father dwell in our hearts by faith, as we're going to read here. Verse 4, and whether I go, you know. And the way you know, Thomas said unto him, Lord, how know, uh, we know not where you're going, and how can we know the way? Yeshua said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. Yeshua says, have I been with you so long and you have not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how do you say then, show us the Father? Believe you not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. So Yeshua even said that he wasn't the one doing the works. It's the Father in him. He's the vessel, just like we are. We don't do the works. We're obedient. We go out, we lay hands on the sick, and they recover. We don't make them recover. We go out and lay hands on the sick. That's our part. And we believe that what God said was going to happen, that's what hooks us up to his power. And then it's his power working in us that heals the sick. We're just the vessel. But we have to believe it, and we have to go, and we have to lay our hands on it. It doesn't happen automatically. We can pray, and God can do things over distance too, but it still involves our faith, and we still have to use our words So into verse 10, it says he does the works. Verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these because, uh, shall he do because I go to my Father. He's starting to give us some insight here. We're going to do the same works and greater that he did because the same Father now lives in us as lived in Yeshua. And it was the Father that did the works in Yeshua. The Father does the works in us now. So everywhere we go, we lay hands on the sick, they recover. It's the Father doing the work. Verse 13.
and whatever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, he told us in John 3 that we have to be born again. And he, he told that to Nicodemus. Now he's explaining how this process works for the Jews, at least, the ones that understand his commandments that have been raised in it. They were circumcised on the eighth day. Circumcision won't save you. It marks you for Yahweh, though. But then when you get old enough, you have to do something. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. See, the Jews grew up with his commandments. They understood that it was from Genesis to Malachi in their Bibles. Or Actually, it didn't end with Malachi in their Bible. But it was the whole Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Kituvim, the, the law and the, the prophets and the writings. Verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide in you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. This is the difference of the new covenant versus the old. In the older covenants, the Holy Spirit was with us. Prophets raised the dead. Prophets healed the sick. Prophets did a lot of things. We had, um, um, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, Bezalel and Holiav. He anointed them to build the, the tabernacle. He gave them supernatural wisdom. The Holy Spirit moved of all, but it wasn't promised to everybody. It was promised to the prophets, basically. But in the new covenant, it was going to be for everybody. And the apostles, this is he's talking to the apostles. He says, you, you've known the Holy Spirit. He's been with you. You've been raising the sick or healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils. You've known the Holy Spirit. He's been with you, but he's going to be in you. And that's the difference in the new covenant. He's going to be in every one of us. But it's a process. The first step is if you love me, so we first have to know about him, we first have to decide that we love him, and then we demonstrate our love to him by keeping his commandments, like he said. And then he prays the Father, and then the Father gives us the Holy Spirit. Once we make that determination, that he may abide with us forever, verse 17, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him, for he has dwells in you and shall, or with you and shall be in you. Then he goes on and explains who the Holy Spirit is in verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So Yeshua is the Holy Spirit. He's part of Elohim. The Father is the Holy Spirit. He's part of Elohim. Verse 19, yet a little while, and the world sees me no more, but you see me. Because I live, you shall live also. Why is that? He's about to tell us. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He ties us all in together. We are echad with Elohim. We are part of that stairway that leads to heaven. Led Zeppelin had no clue. They wanted to be. <laughs> they were deceived. They got went into the counterfeit. But we literally are that gap. We are in Yeshua, who is the bridge, and the angels travel up and down upon Yeshua, the Son of Man. And we've got that job now. We can expect the angels to work with us, traveling up and down, bringing messages. We literally have been fused together with Yeshua. Now, we're nothing in and of ourselves. We have to abide in him, and that comes through obedience. John 15 is a very clear passage about salvation. We have to be born again, and that's how we become a branch in the vine of Yeshua. But then we have to abide, and that's through obedience. What the result is we bear fruit. It's a process that we have to walk out. Just being born again is just the start of that process. It, it's not an automatic finish. We have to endure until the end. We have to abide in Yeshua, and that's through obedience. But the process, Yeshua is explaining. At that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. In us dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. We should actually be able to say, if somebody asks us, show us the Father. Well, have you not known me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We need to get to the point where we've crucified our flesh to that point where the Holy Spirit flows freely through us. Like Peter, his shadow healed people. Like Paul, the cloths on his body, they took them off and put them on people, and they were healed. These are the kinds of things that the Father wants to happen in our presence. And we can get to that point. 
He's in there. We just have to crucify our flesh. That's our job. We have to bring our thoughts to the obedience of Messiah. We have to present our bodies as living sacrifices. And the more we practice it, the easier it gets. It's building habits, healthy habits, using discipline. But it's the same spirit that raised Mashiach from the dead that's in us, giving us the will and the ability to do it. We have got the ability to do it. We just need to know it, and we need to meditate on it, and we need to thank him for it daily. Verse 21, he that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. He wants us to demonstrate our love to him. He wants us to keep his commandments to prove that we do love him. And he that loves me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him based on our obedience. And he wants to, but we have to choose to be obedient. Judah said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, if is it that you will manifest unto us and not to the world? Yeshua said unto him, If a man loves me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, Yeshua and the Father, through the Holy Spirit. We get the whole enchilada, the whole trinity comes to abide within us. The Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loves me not keeps not my sayings. We can prove it one way or the other. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard how that I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice. Because I said, I go to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before, before it comes to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. So he wants us to believe, and that's what faith is, is believing God, trusting God that his word is true. Hereafter, I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. That's how we prove to the world that we love the Father. We obey, just like Yeshua did for our example to Father. Arise, let us go hence. So Yeshua set an example of how to love the Father and revealed to us that we are one with Him. We are one with the Father and that we are to glorify the Father in our actions. He's made us part of one another through Him as well. And that's something else we need to realize. It's not just the Father that we're one with. We're one with each other in the body of Messiah, in a supernatural joining that the Father has done. We are echad with him. We are one body, one people. Let's look at John 17. It says, These words spoke Yeshua and lifted up his eyes to the Father. See, this was after Passover was over, and he's going to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. These words spoke Yeshua and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your son that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know you and the only true God and Yeshua Messiah whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify you me with your own self, with the glory which I had before the world was. Yeshua preexisted. He was with the Father. He's the creator. We know that. And he's making it clear here. I have manifest your name unto the men which you have given me out of the world. Yours they were. And you gave them unto me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are of you. For I have given unto them the words which you have gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from you, and they have believed. 
that you did send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for the ones that you have given me, for they are yours and all mine are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your own name those who you have given me that they may be one. As we are Echad. Now, the reality is that we are one. He's joined us together. We're one body. He's the head. We are one body made up of many members, and we're interconnected through the joints that he's, he has made in his body, and each joint supplies. So we're one already, but he wants us to know it. Verse 12, While I was with them in the world. I kept them in your name. Those that you gave me, I have kept and lost none of them, but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now I come unto you, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them my word, and the word, the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So we can expect to be hated, guys. Yeshua said it. It's not a bed of roses. He's promising. The end result's going to be awesome, but the process to get there is going to be a trial. It's going to be a lot of tests that we're going to have to pass. Verse 15, I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me unto the world, into the world, even so I also have sent them into the world. See, we take over his job, basically. Same assignment. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our unity is going to convince the world that Yahweh is real, because the world is at division right now. They're, they're divided. And when they see us rise up in unity, the true unity of the spirit, it's going to make an impact like nothing they've ever seen before. Because it's going to be accompanied with signs and wonders as well. The love of Yahweh manifested to him. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them. As you have loved me, his love is available to everybody. And that's the message we've got to take to him. Everybody has to choose. Father, I will that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you have sent me and I have declared unto them your name and will declare it that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them and I in them. See, this supernatural birth is way bigger than we ever imagined. We have literally been grafted in to Yeshua. We become his body and he is the head of his body. He talks about that in Ephesians to the assembly. But above and beyond that, we're one with the Father. We're seated right beside the Father. Everywhere the Father is, which is everywhere, we're there with him. We are fused together. It's not like you can look at a body and say, where's my spirit in this body? Well, the scripture talks about that the flesh without the spirit is dead. So our spirit has to be connected with our flesh in every aspect. It's basically when you're seeing me, you're seeing my flesh, but my spirit is behind all of it because if there was no spirit in my finger, my finger would die. Soul is the same way. It, it's not like the soul's here or, or here. It's all of us. Everywhere you see, we are. We, it's kind of like it, it, it takes the same space, basically, like different, different dimensions or whatever, but we occupy the same space. We, when you're seeing any part of my body, you're seeing my spirit and soul. You can't actually see it, but it's right there. It's the same way with Yahweh. When we become one spirit with him, wherever his spirit is, we're there joined with him through Yeshua. And he's everywhere. 
we're with him everywhere. So you can't just say in the part of God, there's me. No, you're everywhere. Everywhere he is, we're fused together with him, and we are part of the one. He's everything. It's almost like Star Trek with the bad side is the Borg. We're going to assimilate everything. You become one with the collective. That's kind of how it is with Yahweh, except it's a voluntary thing that he offers to everybody. You don't have to join it, but you become part of the collective. We know all things. All that wisdom's in us. We, are, we have the creator of the universe in us. And we can access it as we pray in the spirit, as we ask him. He wants to show us. He says, you don't have any need that any man should teach you, but the anointing that you've had in you and that abides in you will teach you of all things. Like we just read in John 14, the Holy Spirit will reveal everything I've said. He's there to show us, to lead us, to guide us. We just have to ask him, but we have to ask in faith. It says that in James, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and, and doesn't upbraid. But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. For a man that doubts is like a ship driven by the waves that, that's like double-minded, and he won't receive anything from God. Doesn't mean that God's not trying to give it, but we have to ask in faith, and we get faith by studying his word. We saturate ourselves with his word. We make his word part of us. We meditate in his Torah day and night, like he told Joshua. Then we think his thoughts, and we act the way that he acts. We've got to brainwash ourselves, and it has to be on purpose. It won't happen by itself. We have to choose to. But if we do... That's how we kill our flesh and we become like him. He's already there in us. We just let him flow. And that's what he wants us to do. Now, he, again, in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, we know it talks about his body. I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but his body is made up of many members. There's, there's different gifts. There's the power gifts, the working of miracles, the gifts of faith, gifts of healings. You've got the revelation gifts. You've got words of wisdom, words of knowledge, discerning of the spirits. You've got tongues and interpretation and prophecy, all the gifts. But then it talks about helps and other things as well. There's all these different gifts that are in his body. But we're one body. We all have different anointings, different callings, different, different tasks that we're supposed to do. But we're one. And we're joined together. When one part of the body hurts, we all hurt. When one part of the body rejoices, we're all supposed to rejoice. We are connected because we're all part of him. And so just like Achan, when he sinned and it affected not just his family, they were all slaughtered. It affected 33 Israelites because we're one. We're connected together. We are the people Israel. We're one nation. And the reality of it is through the Holy Spirit, we're one spirit now. I mean, we are joined that intimately together. Everything we do affects one another. We've got to keep this in mind. It's not just going to affect us or just our family. It affects the whole thing. It affects Yahweh. That's why he says, be holy because I'm holy. He wants us to be like him. He wants the blessing in every area. We are so connected that we just got to understand we have got a grave responsibility, not just for our own personal salvation, but for the collective, for the one who deserves everything. He is the I am. And we, he deserves all obedience, all love, everything. He's, he didn't have to create us. He didn't have to do any of this. He chose to. He wanted to. He wanted to have somebody like himself to fellowship with, to commune with, to interact with, somebody that would have free will. The angels had to do it. They were basically instructed, you're going to do this. It's like being a boss and having employees. They don't have the option of disobeying unless they want to get fired, and that's kind of what happened to the devil in his group. But he made us with that right to choose, and it blesses him so much when we use our free will. That's the only thing we really have that we can give him. I mean, we belong to him, our body, our spirit. He made us, but he gave us free will. And we can freely choose to give that back to him, to truly bless our father as he deserves. And it blesses him so much when we make that choice because we don't have to. We do it because we want to, because we realize how awesome he is and what he deserves. And we freely give that back to him, and it blesses his heart so much because we're one. And it blesses one another when we do that. Just like when we rebel, rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. It's turning away from the Father. That's, that's what Adam decided to do. And it affected the whole human race. We're interconnected. Everything we do affects not just us, it affects everything. And we've got to keep this in mind. But we don't do it in our own strength. Like it says in Philippians, it's God that's in us, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. We have to make the decision to walk the way we're supposed to walk. We have to do the homework to study his word, to meditate, to know what he wants us to do. So we've got responsibility. It just takes our decision to do it. Matthew 25, 
I mean, he talks about when he returns, he's going to separate between the sheep and the goats. And the sheep he puts on his right hand, the goats on his left. And he tells them that whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me because we are connected. We are part of him. And when we treat each other in a certain way, that's what we're doing to the creator of the universe. We need to understand this, how real this really is. It's not a light thing. And it has eternal consequences. We need to every morning get in his presence and seek his face and ask him to fill us to the full so that we can let him flow through us. We're already full. I mean, it's just a matter of we can experience more of him at certain times what it really is is he doesn't come and go he's always there it's just us killing our flesh a little more to let more of him through it's like we're a circuit breaker and the more we spend in his word and the more we meditate and the more we operate in faith it's like going to the gym you have to build your faith you don't go to the gym and bench press 500 pounds right off the bat you got to work up to it it takes years you might not ever get there but it takes time if you're dedicated and you you work out and do the proper things, you can eventually get to that point. We've got to do that. We've got to get to be like Yeshua through doing what he did, his lifestyle. We have to be disciplined. We have to read his word. We have to meditate in it day and night. We have to pray without ceasing. I mean, we can watch TV. We can do all these things 24-7. It's pleasing to the flesh. We know we have the ability to. It's just our flesh doesn't want to. We can meditate in the Torah day and night. Just Instead of watching TV, turn it off. Get in the Bible. Read it. I know your flesh doesn't want to. I mean, you'd rather sit there be entertained by the Game of Thrones or whatever. I don't even know what's on anymore. I haven't watched TV in years, but we can be entertained and be on the bride path and go to hell, or we can be self-disciplined and meditate in his word day and night like he tells us to. Be like Yeshua. Have purpose in our life. And it will affect the whole body. And it will affect the Father, and it will affect our families. We're going to affect everybody anyway. It's just a matter of what we choose to affect them with. So we have to make these choices. We have to get into the Word. We have to pray without ceasing. We have to choose to. And he knows we're not necessarily going to be perfect. We have to build he he healthy habits. We've got into the habit. I mean, it's just like smoking, brother. We got into that habit. We got addicted. We can get addicted to his Word in the same way. Now, it won't be through our flesh. It'll have to be through our spirit. But we can build those healthy habits in the same way that our flesh gets these habits, that we, we get these addictions. We can be possessed. We are possessed by the Heavenly Father. And we need to let that spirit influence our lives now rather than the ones that are trying to push against our flesh. And it's what we do with our mind that tips the scale one way or the other. The Holy Spirit is in our spirits, and it wants to do the will of God. Our flesh is our flesh, and we won't be rid of it until we get glorified bodies. It's going to be constantly pulling us towards sin. And what we do with our mind, it's what's going to tip the scale one way or the other. We have to make that determination. We have to renew our minds with the Word of God. You can unwind and watch entertainment, but make sure it's something that gets you to thinking about Him. It doesn't always just have to be watching the Bible or whatever. I mean, there's some movies out there that will get you excited about Him. They're not all going to be perfect. Very few of them are. But they can lead you that way where you're thinking about him and, and thinking about eternal things. He's, Yeshua said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. There's only one thing that's eternal in this realm that we can put within us, that we can store up treasures in heaven by giving to the poor, by doing the things that he puts. We have to decide to do it, though. It takes our choice and then our dedication, commitment. He's looking for a few good men. Will you make that decision to be one of them? We all have the opportunity and the calling. We all just have to make that decision to be diligent in doing it. He is love. And we are to be love as well. Just like Yeshua told Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We should be in that same way. We should be loved just like he is love. In 1 John 4, 8, I want to just read 1 John 4. The whole thing, it's a good chapter. First John chapter 4 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. See, there's going to be a lot of spirits rising up. There already is in these last days. People are confused about what gender they are. It's not like rocket science. Look between your legs. That, that tells you pretty much what you are. These spirits want you to believe goofy stuff. So we've got to try the spirits. 
whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua Messiah is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Yeshua Messiah is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of anti-Messiah, wherever you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. Your mouth is going to reveal what's in your heart. If you have the word in your heart, you're going to be speaking the word. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. We've got to program ourselves to do this, though. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loves is born of God. And knows God. Now, this, this word love is agape here. It's not just a feeling. It is a decision based on covenant that you understand you're in covenant with the Creator, and that He has cho chosen by covenant to love us even if we stumble and fall. That doesn't affect His choice. Same way with us and others. If they sin against us, we don't say, hey, that's broken the covenant. No, we keep loving them. We pray for them. And then we try to restore the relationship. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears not us. Hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is is love so that's how we can reflect god to the world is through love his love in this was manifest the love of god towards us because that god sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him here in his love not that he loved god that we love god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins beloved if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. We owe it to God to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. See, this verse tells us the Father's never been to the earth. No man has ever seen God at any time, only Yeshua. When the Father returns, he melts everything. His glory is so intense. That's the melts the elements with fervent heat. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. We have a spiritual witness, but we also know it because we keep his commandments. In the couple chapters back, it tells us that. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever shall confess that Yeshua is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love of, that God has to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God and God in him. You can't separate God from his love because he is love. And that is supposed to be what defines us. We are to lay down our lives for one another, for our wives, for our children. Yeshua says in John, I think it's 14 or 13, greater love has no man than he, a man laid down his life, his life for his friends. And he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. It's all based on obedience. Here is our love made perfect, verse 17, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. Fear is a spirit. He says, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we are not to fear. We are in covenant with the creator. We are one echad with the creator of the universe. A demon tries to come against us. We just need to laugh in his face and say, hey, you think so? Guess who's with me? The one that made you. Bow your knee. And we have that authority, and we can say it in confidence. And they have no other choice because we've got all of heaven backing us up. 
they're behind us. Just like a police officer directing traffic, you could squish him with your car. But when he raises your hand, he, you stop because you know the authority that's behind him. We don't have anything in and of ourselves like that policeman. We've got all of heaven behind us. When we speak his words, another part that he showed me, it's not just us speaking his word. That, that's powerful. But what it is, we're his body. We're his mouthpiece now. When we speak his word and we know it's his word, he says, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We know if we hear us, we know we have the petitions we desire. It's not just because we know it's his will. It's because when we speak and we're in right relationship with him and we're speaking his word, it's the father speaking through us. We are his body. He is the word. And when we speak these words, they are spirit and they are life and the father himself. The demons hear the father when we speak and we're in line with him. And they obey. They know they have no choice. When we realize who we really are, the demons cannot resist. We just have to know it, and we have to enforce it by our faith, by knowing that God's behind us. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Guess what? Because his brother's part of God. If you hate your brother, you're hating God. That's how connected we are. And this commandment have we from him, that he who loves God loves his brother also, because we're all connected. My Messianic brothers, there's so much hatred in our midst for Christians. What we came out of. Most of them really love God. They just don't know him. They've been lied to. They're ignorant. They don't read their own Bibles. We know that. But we don't hate them. We are to love them because they're part of God. If they've been born again, they are our brothers. They're part of the same body. And the way we treat them is the way we're treating Yeshua. Yeah, they're not perfect. We're not either. We need to understand we've got flesh. We blow it. We have nothing to be haughty about. God in his mercy has shared with us some truth and we need to share it lovingly and we need to pray for those that don't see it. Knowing that Satan's trying to destroy him, we've got a common enemy and we're one people, we're one body and we need to love our brothers. What's well, hard to understand, we know where we've come from, we know the error that we walked in, but it wasn't all error. They're using the right book. The Jews are using the right book. There's some truth in Judaism. It's not enough to get you there. But if a Christian's read in the Bible and he saw about being born again and he literally, without knowing God fully, asked to be part of him, God in his mercy will get them born again. His spirit will be in them. And then he can start leading them. I mean, all of us pretty much started out in the church. We started out in a relationship with Yahweh and he just kind of perfected us. He pulled us out of the junk and gave us some more truth. But he was patient with us. We all came from that background pretty much. And we've got to learn to be patient with one another because we're part of the same body. The enemy's trying to destroy us all and we need to watch each other's backsides. We need to be praying for one another. It says in 1 John 5, if you see your brother sin a sin that's not unto death, he says, I say, ask, and I will give life to him that sins not unto death. But we have to ask first. He's not going to do it unless we intercede. Because he's got to go through our authority. He's given the dominion and the authority in this realm to man until he comes to take it back. So it's our job to intercede for one another, to stand for one another, to keep the enemy under our feet, to pray for one another, pray that our eyes are open. It doesn't mean that we prune one another. We pray so that the Father can do the pruning. We're the vine. Yeshua is the, Yeshua is the vine. We're the branches. But the Father does the pruning. And we've got to be patient and love people and pray for people so the Father can prune them and we can all become like Yeshua. It's not our job to conform one another. It's the Father's job. He's conforming us to the image of the Son. We have to be patient and we have to love one another to help draw it and make the process faster. If we are loving one another and not criticizing, we're going to be able to build relationships and then we'll have an input to be able to share some more truth into each other's lives. We'll want to because we'll know that we're for one another that we love one another. That's the living relationship that Yahweh wants with him and his children and us to have with one another.
It's got to be his way. Now, we're part of him now, and our responsibility is to look like him. We owe it to him to represent him to the world. This is our mission. We've taken over Yeshua's role. You know Yeshua loved everybody. That's our job now. And he knows we're not going to be perfect. We blow it. But as soon as we blow it, let's repent and let's get back up and say, Father, forgive me and forgive my brother. He's not walking right. Satan's trying to destroy him. And you don't want to lose one. So, Father, have mercy. We need to be crying out for one another, not criticizing, not condemning, but loving because God is love. And we are joined to him. If we're truly born again, love is within us. He shed his love abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. But our responsibility, we have to put on love as a garment. It's not an automatic thing. We do that by meditating in his word, by focusing on these things and choosing to make the right decisions that he wants us to. It's our responsibility. We're all going to give accountability to him one day, not just about how we acted between us and him, but how we treated one another. That's what John Excuse me, Matthew 25 is all about judging between the sheep and the goats. How did we treat one another? That's the judgment on the second greatest commandment. Did we love our neighbors ourself? He's judging us about that in Matthew 25 between the sheep and the goats. He said, I was hungry. You gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me drink naked. You clothed me sick in prison. And you came and visited me. And they said, when did we do that with you? He said, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. And same way on the flip side, when the other ones didn't do it. They said, when did we not see you and not do that to you? He says, when you did it not to the least of these, my brothers, you did it not to me. The reality is we are connected to one another, and we are connected to him. If we're born again, we are echad with Elohim, and we are echad with one another. And we literally are part of that bridge where the angels ascend and descend. We need to give them something holy and righteous to do that with, just like Yeshua did. We need to be the gap. We need to be the bridge between the spiritual and the physical so that we can show people the way, the truth, and the life. We're part of that now. We're part of him. And he wants to shine through us. He wants to love through us in the same way he did when he was here in his own body because now we're his body. And that's our responsibility and our job. And our Father deserves it. We owe it to him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for teaching us who we really are and who you really are. You are love. You are everything. And we've been made part of you. Father, thank you. For your great mercy wherewith you have loved us when we didn't deserve it we deserve death but because you are love you gave us life father teach us not to give one another what we deserve but the mercy that you have shown help us to love at all times a true agape love is not based on anything the other person does or doesn't do it's based on a decision to love a covenant commitment. Father, help us to understand who we really are and the importance of our actions and our words and how we treat one another. Because how we treat one another is how we are treating you. And Father, we want to love you. We want to bless you. We want to honor you because you deserve it. So help us to do this with one another. Even though we don't deserve it, Father, we don't deserve your love. We don't deserve to be loved by one another. Help us all to make that choice, though, because love never fails, and love will conform us to the image of your dear Son. Light drives out the darkness. Love drives out the hate. Father, fill us so full that there is no room for anything else. You have made us a kingdom of priests. I thank you for the blessing on your people, Israel. Yivarechecha Yahweh, Vayishmarecha. Ya'er Yahweh, Penave Lecha, Vihunecha. Yesa Yahweh. Panave lecha, 
וישים לך שלום. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Hallelujah. I love you, my brothers and sisters. Go with Yahweh. In the name of Yeshua. Hallelujah.